8 p.m. We continue to study uh, the letter of James. There's also a PW rally in First Limavady. Uh, that's on Thursday evening, and the Kennedys are speaking at that, and all ladies are welcome. Under other announcements, Irish Men's Convention is a wee bit away, um, but um, that's planned for the end of February, but tickets are out in the near future, and so if you're interested, uh, please speak to me about that, um, preferably in the next couple of Sundays. A uh, note under forward dates, we have our PW service with Stephen Cowan next Sunday. There'll be obviously a retiring offering, we'll go to the PW, and then the following week, God willing, BB enrollment. There is a fun day has been organized for Wednesday the 2nd, that's 2 to 5.15 p.m. Like last year, we'll be in the hall, inflatables, etc., then food, and then Colin Tilsley will bring a Bible story and songs here in the church at the end. So we encourage uh, children. Uh, to come along to that. That's Wednesday, the 2nd of November. A note, an advance notice also of the um, next PW, which is on the 7th of November. We'll highlight that again uh, next Sunday. So there are a number of things there to note. You will also, within your announcement sheet, uh, receive an update in regards to the shoe boxes and the Smartens uh, purse. And again, just there are leaflets and how to fill, if that's your choice, or if you prefer to make a donation, then envelopes are available also uh, to enable you to do that. And it'll be on uh, Wednesday, the 9th of November, from 10.30 uh, forward, where they'll be filled in the John Davy Hall. So remember, you have different options. We encourage your support of that. And of course, the United Appeal, just to remind you that the autumn collection of the United Appeal, uh, that um, should be in today. On the back, uh, you'll notice a couple of other invitations. So please make sure you turn over, one relating to the Ark tomorrow night, one relating to uh, First Garba as well, and then a tear fund event, which is also on. So please uh, take note of these. And finally, we're mentioning the shoe boxes, the PW. We're grateful to the ongoing generosity on the congregation. Note that the Children's Society um, offering amounted to £1,083.75. So thank you uh, for that. A very good amount. And the harvest offering for the property fund, 12376 So we commend you for your generosity and thank you most sincerely for that. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Acts chapter 10. I know we took about four weeks to go through chapter 9, but we're going to take an overview of chapter 10, the conversion of the first Gentile, a man called Cornelius. Paul reminds us in Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let us pray as we seek God's blessing. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather as your people. We commit this time to you and pray that by your Spirit, you would lead and guide us and draw close to each one of us. And may Jesus be exalted. In his name we pray. Amen. God of grace, amazing wonder is our opening praise.
Let's join in prayer. Lord God, as we come to you today, we praise you and thank you that we worship a God of grace, a God of love. And we thank you for extending your grace to us. And we recognize indeed that all of us are unworthy of your love. We deserve only condemnation. But we thank that in love you sent Jesus to rescue us and to redeem us. And we thank you that in Christ and in your grace we can stand redeemed and forgiven and secure. Indeed, your word reminds us that when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, we are yours eternally, and none can pluck us from your hand. But Lord, we confess that often we, we question our faith and we wonder about how secure we are. Remind us that you, the sovereign God, God hold us firmly in your everlasting arms. As we approach you today, we do so with a sense of humility and a sense of brokenness because we recognize our feelings. We recognize the sin in our hearts that grieves you, causes you to mourn. And we pray that graciously you might forgive us. We pray that in your mercy and love you will restore us and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. We thank you that when we allow your Holy Spirit to reign within us, that our lives are radically different. And we think of Paul's letter to the believers in Galatia, where he speaks about the fruit of flesh and then the fruit of the Spirit, and what a great contrast there is. And when we truly have the Spirit reigning within us, there will be joy and love and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness, self-control, all these beautiful traits. And Lord, we pray that we will indeed exhibit these as the Holy Spirit controls us and guides us. We thank you that we have your eternal word to read. And Lord, you have promised that your word will not return unto you void, but accomplish that which you desire. And so again, we pray today as your word is read and studied that it will touch many hearts. And as we look in the book of Acts at the conversion of the first Gentile, we pray that we will be encouraged and reminded that the gospel is for all. It is an all-inclusive gospel that anyone who truly repents from whatever background or creed can know forgiveness of sins and have that assurance of a home one day in heaven. As we abide before you, you know our thoughts. Indeed, nothing is hidden from you. You're the God who knows our words before they're uttered, you know even what we think. And Lord, you know where there's concern and heartache and pain. And we ask that you draw near. Bring your healing touch. We pray that you would renew and strengthen us. We pray that you would continually transform us. And Lord, mold us into the image of Christ, our Savior. We pray too that you would close out all distractions from our minds. And help us in this hour of worship to focus upon you to listen attentively for you to speak. And may all honor and glory be to the lovely name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. If you turn to uh, your pew Bible, if you want to follow along, page 1103, as where it begins, and then going over the page. Acts chapter 10, as I said at the beginning, we did look at chapter 9 over about four weeks. Uh, we're going to take an overview of this chapter um, today. It's a significant chapter in the story of the early church as Cornelius, a Gentile, comes to faith in Christ and his household. Page 1103. This is God's Word. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a Centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him, 
had the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the rooftop to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he would hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The next day Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for him immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then P Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, whom, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did, in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him up from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not only seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came and all who heard the message, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Children, can I ask you to come for a few minutes to the front, please?
Okay? All right. Okay, Nina. Now we the come, Well done. Okay, lovely to see so many of you out this morning. Uh, I'm going to chat to you for a few minutes, and I'm going to... There's a few bears up as well. Yeah? Is it turned around the other way? <coughs> oh, yeah, it's just a sleeping. All right. Right. Okay, question. What is the word? There's a word up there. There's only one letter shown. What's the one letter that's been shown? Faithful. Faithful. Oh, you're guessing. Well, I'll give you clues in a minute. It's not faithful. What's the one letter that's been shown? You have the first letter, which is F. F. And do you know how many other letters there are? Can you see? You're good outside. How many other letters? One for each of the dash. Yeah? How many is there in total? Nine. Well done. Nine. There's nine letter word. It begins with F. And I'll give you some clues. And it's got to do with the reading. Because we read there in Acts 10. And it was something that Peter came to realize about God. Okay? But some of the clues are a wee bit harder than the last one. If you don't get them, you'll get the last one and then you'll understand. Okay. What color of a car is that? Hmm? Gray. Well done. You're going to say gray? Yep, it is gray. Yep. So the color gray. All right? Keep that in mind. Cars colored gray. Okay? That's the first clue. Okay. Sweets. What kind? Celebration. Celebration. Now, do you see the one over on the right-hand side? It's almost empty. And you see the sweets on the right-hand side? It's almost empty. There's one Mars, but what's the rest? They're nearly all one type. Yeah, Mars is in there. Do you see the other ones? They're bluey and white. Yeah. What one? What are they? Coconut. Coconut, that's right. Bounty, coconut. Right. Why is there about six or seven of them? And there's no Twix, there's no Snickers, all the rest are gone, Milky Way. Why, why is there so many of them? <laughs> there's a good reason. Does that happen in your house? Yeah. 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 The, bu- the bounty are left? Yeah. The bounty are left, it happens in the months as well, a lot of places. Sometimes there's one type and people don't like it as much, so it's left. So that's a clue, all right? Because they take, they take the ones they like first, isn't that right? When you have a box of celebrations, you take the ones you like first and you leave the ones you don't. Okay, now, what is that? It's a puppy. Okay, right. And puppies can be a pet. So how many different types of pets do you, can you think of? You tell me, what types of pets can you think of? Okay. That's a puppy, what else? What, what could you have? A cat and a dog, that is a dog. Any other pets? Do, do any rest of you pets? Hamster. Hamster. Can you think? Um, pet. Uh-huh. Birds. Par- Birds, yes. Chickens. Yes, chickens, rabbits. Yeah, all sorts of pets. So this is a clue. Okay, let's just say there are a lot of these. Okay. So a lot of people have pets and there's a lot of dogs. Okay. What type of ice cream do you think that is? Another, right? All sorts of ice creams. If I was asked you to name different types, you could name a whole lot. But that's vanilla ice cream. So there's something linking all these things. And then the last clue, who's that? He's from the Old Testament. He had a whole lot of brothers, and he was given a special coat. Who is it? Joseph. That's right. Joseph. Why did Joseph, and this is the best clue, why did Joseph get that coat and none of his brothers did? And remember the word beginning with F? Faithful. No, that's not faithful. That does begin with F. Why did he get it? His father gave it to him and he didn't give it to anyone else because Joseph was the favorite. Favoritism. That's right. Joseph was the favorite. That's the word beginning with F. Favorite. Now, just to explain where these come from, okay? Oops, right. Gray is the favorite color in Britain of cars. You probably... Well, it's so the internet says we're four years in a row. Black is second choice, white is third. I'm not sure if Northern Ireland is what it is, but in Britain it said grey. There's a lot of grey cars. The least favourite sweet is the bounty one, the coconut one. 
Everything else is eaten first and it's left. Okay. The favorite pet is? Dogs. dogs. Yeah. Far more dogs than any other pets. The favorite ice cream flavor vanilla. is vanilla. Now, it mightn't be your favorite, but according to research, more people like vanilla than anything else, and that's across the world. Okay. As I said, favorite son, Joseph. He received the coat when his brothers didn't. That word favorite, that came up, or favoritism, that came up in the reading because this is what Peter said. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. And see, that was a lesson that Peter had to learn. Peter was a Jew, and he believed that God sent Jesus to the Messiah, and the Jews were all that mattered. Okay, he was a Jew, he was proud of being a Jew, and that was all that mattered. And he thought that God wasn't interested in people who weren't Jews. They were called Gentiles. But then he had this vision, and we read about it if you're listening to the reading. And there's a sheet. He fell asleep, and he had a dream. Do you ever have a dream in your sleep? Yes. Well, probably not one like Peter. He saw this big sheet been lowered down, and it was full of all sorts of animals, crawly animals, and all sorts of things. And there were some that, as a devout Jew, he wouldn't touch. And God said, Arise, get up, kill, and eat. And he was shocked. No, no, surely not. I have never touched anything unclean. And God said, Don't call unclean what I have cleansed. But the story wasn't really about animals because then these men arrived and they said Cornelius wanted Peter to go to his house. Cornelius wasn't a Jew, he was different. And Peter used to think, God's not interested in those Gentiles. We Jews are the favorite. He's not interested in others, but God said, I love all. And Peter went to Caesarea, and he shared with this man, and this man came to love Jesus and to follow him. And this is what Peter said, now I know God doesn't have favorites. God loves everyone. Okay, so remember, when you're picking ice cream, you might have a favorite flavor. When you're dipping into the box of celebrations, you might have your favorite. But remember, God doesn't have any favorites. God loves every boy and girl, every adult here, every boy and girl throughout the world. They're all precious. And there used to be a little chorus many, many years ago we used to sing, Jesus loves the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. God loves each one of us. Jesus died for all that's what John 316 3, says. God so loved the world, he loved the world, he loved everyone, he gave his son that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So remember, God doesn't have favorites. He loves us all. Peter realized that, and we praise God that he loved us enough to send his son to die for us. Let's talk to God for a moment. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Okay? <coughs> Father, we thank you for your amazing love. We thank you that you love each one of us so much that Jesus died for us. And we thank you that when we trust in Jesus, you will take us to be with you one day. You will make us your child. We pray that you'll bless all these children at home, at school, in children's church, and indeed throughout the week. Watch over them and protect them and their loved ones. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Right. Before we sing... Um, Hopefully, what you want's not at the bottom. It probably is. Favorite instruments always in the bottom, isn't it? We might need two boxes for you. Oh, well done. Okay, Rose. Yep. <laughs> you grab first.
Your offering will be received, and the choir going to sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Thank you to the choir and Ethne. Um, beautiful words, grace that is greater than all our sin. We want to pray for others. We remember those who are in hospital at this time. And we continue to pray for a troubled world. Then also uh, the faith mission with Andrew Mabin and Johnny and Amy Lennox are involved next weekend in Tobermore uh, with special outreach with a truck. Um, they have prayer services, they have children's events, young people's events. So we pray that God will indeed watch over that. It's Saturday, Sunday, and Monday next weekend. And we pray for the ongoing activities here in Agadou. Thankful for God's blessing and protection. And we thank especially of next Sunday, the PW Sunday, and then the children's event as well. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, we praise you for the words the choir have been sharing. We thank you for your wonderful grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse, grace that is greater than all our sin. We want to lift up before you today as our prayers of intercession, those who are unwell within the congregation, especially those in hospital at this time. And Lord, we pray that even today you will draw near to them. We ask, Lord, that they would know your presence and your peace. Lord, help them to look to you, the one who is all-powerful, the one who is the sovereign God, but the one who draws close in times of trouble. And Lord, we praise you that you never abandon us, you never forsake us. We thank you for our local hospital and the causeway and for all the skills and expertise you have given to surgeons and to doctors and nurses and all uh, the supporting staff. We pray that you'd use these skills and this knowledge to bring healing to many. We pray also for those who are advanced in years and 
ones who are faithful coming along Sunday by Sunday to worship you here. And we pray that even as many will listen in through uh, the live stream, that they will know your presence and your touch. And that, Lord, know that we remember them and think fondly of them. We pray for the work of this congregation week by week. We thank you for Sunday School and GRID. We thank you for the good numbers coming along to the Boys Brigade and to the toddlers, to the youth club, to all the organizations. And Lord, we pray for your continued protection, especially upon our young people. And Lord, we ask that each one will indeed realize that they are special to you, that you sent your Son to save all. We pray your blessing upon next Sunday and the plans for the PW service. We thank you for Stephen and Angelina and for all the deputation they're undertaking as they come next Sunday or Stephen comes. We pray that he would know your touch and that, Lord, you indeed would use him mightily to challenge and to encourage. We pray, too, for other outreach at this time. We pray for the special children's event on Wednesday week that you would guide the planning of that. We pray, too, for uh, the event in Tobermore, organized by the Babins and by Johnny and Amy Lennox. We pray, Lord, as that uh, truck that leads the outreach there amongst people of all ages and children and young people, that your Holy Spirit will be at work. And it is our prayer that many will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We promise also to pray for others today who are hurting and grieving, uh, we think of the family of the teenager sadly losing his life in Kalibaki. And Lord, we ask that that family circle will be aware of your presence and know your touch at a very difficult time. We continue to pray for a troubled world, especially the situation in Ukraine. And Lord, we ask that you draw near to your people in that land. And we do simply pray that this terrible violence would soon come to a complete cessation. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves. We thank you for this opportunity to come again together. We thank you for the offerings given by your people, praying that you will use them for your honor and your glory. And we pray as we would soon turn to your word, that, Lord, our hearts will be open to receive your challenge and that you will richly bless each one. All this we pray in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Familiar phrase, here is love, vast as the oceans. Our third phrase, let's praise God in these lovely words. <laughs> Once there was a very famous violinist by the name of Fritz Kreisler, died in 1962, but he was a world-famous violinist, and he earned a fortune 
through concerts and compositions, but he generously gave most of it away. And so when he discovered an exquisite violin that he liked to purchase, in fact, didn't have sufficient funds for it, so he had to wait for a period of time. He then went back hoping to purchase it, and sadly, in the meantime, it had been sold. It had been sold to a collector. He found out who it was and went to that collector and was keen to buy it. But the man said that it was his most prized possession. He wouldn't sell it. But before Fritz left, uh, this man, Fritz Chrysler, he asked if he could play the instrument one last time before it was ever forever consigned to silence. Probation was granted, and the great uh, virtuoso filled the room with heart-moving music, so much so the emotions of the collector were stirred, and he declared, I have no right to keep that to myself. It's yours, Mr. Chrysler. Take it. Take it into the world and let the people hear it. Well, in Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter came to understand that the gospel was not for Jews only. It was for the world to hear. There are many conversions related in the book of Acts by Luke. There's that of the Ethiopian eunuch. There's that of the apostle Paul. Saul at that time related in chapter 9. Later on, there's Lydia, the first convert in Europe. But none are as significant as the conversion related here in this story, the conversion of this Gentile Cornelius. See, in chapter 2 of Pentecost, the gospel is proclaimed. Many Jews were brought into the church. Then later on, many Samaritans were brought in through the evangelism of Philip, but they were half Jews. But here in chapter 10, we have the first Gentile convert, a man called Cornelius. And that's really what the book of Acts is about, God's love for the whole world. Now, I appreciate that Gentiles could be saved from the beginning in the Old Testament times, but at that time, they were brought into the commonwealth of the nation Israel. For example, Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess, but she joined the community of Israel. But now it's different in the New Testament. Gentiles are coming in the knowledge that they're not required any longer to observe Mosaic law. It's an important step forward in the universal appeal and preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the central story related by Luke in Acts 10 here involves two people and four scenes. The two, two key figures, of course, God is key because he's the mover behind this, but the two key figures are Cornelius. Cornelius is a respected Gentile army officer. The other is a Jew, the apostle Peter. And of course, Peter set out as a very ordinary man, a mere fisherman. They're very different socially, very different ethically, but they become one in Christ. Four scenes really sums up this story. Scene one is in the home of a Gentile seeker, verses one to eight. In the home of Caesarea, we find this man, this man called Cornelius, praying at three in the afternoon. Now, he's a Gentile, that's clear. Not a Jewish convert. That's made plain later uh, in the book of Acts. Cornelius is a Roman name. And as I say, he's not ethnically Jewish. He's a centurion in the Roman army, who, of course, were the occupying force in Israel at that time. But note what it says about him, and indeed says about his whole family right at the beginning. He was a centurion. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. We're told what that means in the next verse. It meant that he was generous. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So here's a man, Cornelius, outside the community of God's people, but ready and prepared to be part of God's work. And while Cornelius is praying, an angel appears, and this is the message coming from the angel from God. Your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And instantly he obeys. He dispatches his servants to get Peter. Now it's vital to understand at this point, Cornelius is not saved. He is not a believer at this point. Yes, he is outwardly moral. He's a pious man. He respects God, the God of Israel. He reverences him, but he's not yet a believer. And as a Roman, he would have been exposed to the Roman gods, to Jupiter and Zeus, to Mars, Venus, many others, but he knew they weren't real. He knew they could do nothing for him. 
and he would have been stationed at various places, stationed now in Palestine, he's exposed to the teaching of Judaism. Scholars tell us that it wasn't unusual for Gentiles to become attracted to Judaism because of the morality and ethical standards of that religion. Some would have attended services and become knowledgeable in the Jewish religious practices. Some prayed and even gave alms to the poor. And Cornelius is in that category. But you know, Cornelius' piety doesn't make him a Christian. It only makes him religious. And his giving alms to the poor, that doesn't make him a Christian either. It makes him generous and thoughtful and compassionate. He needs to hear the gospel to be saved. Good works alone are not sufficient for Cornelius or for any person. And sometimes today, people believe if someone is moral and upright, sure they're destined for heaven, but that's because of a faulty standard being used to judge. You may have heard of the little boy who walked into the kitchen and said to his mom he was six feet tall. Of course, she asked, how did you come to that conclusion? He said, well, I took my shoe and I measured, and I am six feet. With well, a loving smile, she informed him, well, your, your shoe is not a foot. Mom, it must be, because my foot gets into it. But of course, he was using a wrong standard. And often that happens. People believe that if they're moral and upright and good, that's enough. Here's Cornelius, a moral, upright man, but not yet a believer. Scene one is in the home of this Gentile seeker. So then as the story continues into verse nine, the second scene is in the rooftop with a Jew named Peter, Simon named Peter. As the servants of Cornelius are on their way to find Peter, he has a visit of his own while on the rooftop. And God clearly is at work in both the life of Cornelius and the life of Peter. He has this vision, and the blanket comes down, the sheet with all sorts of animals, many he considers to be unclean. And he's horrified, absolutely horrified. Arise and eat, what does he say? Surely not, Lord, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And that process is, that protest is understandable in the light of his upbringing. However, in one sentence here, what does he do? He addresses God as Lord, and yet he says no. And of course, Peter had a habit of saying no to Jesus. Think back to Matthew 16, verse 22. But compare Peter's response, the apostle, to this unsaved Gentile. Peter says, not so, Lord, or some versions, surely not, Lord, Cornelius says simply, what is it, Lord? And in this instance, it seems Cornelius is more responsive to God than Peter was. But those words, surely not, Lord, or not so, Lord, they should never be joined in one sentence. Because when we say, Lord, it suggests deity, it suggests authority, it suggests sovereignty. And should anyone ever say no to God as sovereign and who has authority? But notice how God responds. He speaks Again, with decisive words, verse 15, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Another version puts it this way, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. And Luke tells us this had to happen three times. You see, Peter, someone said, is like all of us. He's a slow learner. He needed this demonstration to be repeated three times. And at this point, he clearly doesn't get it. He clearly doesn't understand what God is trying to teach him. However, as he tries to figure it all out, the meaning of this vision, events move very quickly. And the Spirit tells Peter that three men are looking for him. The Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit, speaking to Peter. And so as the story moves on, the third scene then is in the living room of Simon the Tanner, related in verses 20 to 23. Peter is perplexed, he's confused, he doesn't understand, but he leaves the rooftop to greet the three visitors. And he confirms that he is the one they're looking for, and then he asks the nature of their mission. In response, they identify their master, Cornelius, stressing his character, and then they share about the vision that Cornelius had and the command how they were to go and get Peter to come to speak to him. But note verse 23, what it says there. Verse 23, it says, Then Peter invited the man into the house to be his guest. That's another major step for Peter. If you remember last time we looked at chapter 9, we noted the final verse, how it ended. 
that he was staying in the, so, in the home of Simon the Tanner. Tanners worked with the skins of dead animals. They were considered defiled by Jews, and Jews ostracized them. But here is Peter. God had been working in him. He was staying in the house of a tanner. But another step, more radical, he invites these people into the home. And that was something no Jew would do. Because of <coughs> the restrictions, they would not invite a Jew into the home. They would not sit down with them and eat with them. They wouldn't have fellowship. If someone says, you would expect it, Peter have said, there's an end down the road. Stay there tonight, and I'll speak with you tomorrow. But he invites them in. And remember the great animosity. It was indeed radical for one who was a Jew to invite a Gentile in. And Luke says, he took him in as guest. Verse 25, Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. This is how one man, David Guzik, puts it. Peter didn't just coldly give these Gentiles visitors a room. He entertained them as welcome guests. And he did this against every custom of the Jewish people of his day. What happened in the living room? Well, no doubt they discussed the vision that Cornelius had. And God began to open the eyes of Peter. He began to understand. And probably at that moment, the truth flooded his mind. You see, the vision of Peter was a challenge to accept that the gospel was for all. The purpose of the Old Testament dietary laws was to mark a distinction between Jews and other nations. But here, this distinction has been abolished. It's been set aside. It wasn't really about animals. It was really about people. And God was saying, Peter, don't call this Roman centurion common or unclean because he's a Gentile. He is one of my elect. Peter, don't be afraid to give him the gospel or anyone else for that matter. But then the final scene in Acts 10 is back again to the state of the centurion recorded in verse 24 following. A couple of days have now passed. And Peter and some of the Christians, those from Joppa, head off for Caesarea. It's a long journey. And there are a few extras when he arrives because Cornelius showing great faith has gathered not only his family but other friends. In fact, verse 27 says this, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And again, this is significant. First of all, he invited Gentiles into the home where he was staying. Now he enters the home of a Gentile. That was something extraordinary. And by doing this, he showed that his heart and mind had been changed, that he had learned the lesson of the vision of the great sheet. And he begins by confirming how radical this was. Nobody says, in verse 28, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a gentle, Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. What he's really saying to these people, to Cornelius and to those assembled, they're not really supposed to be here as a Jew. And indeed, back in Jerusalem, my Jewish friends would be outraged. They would have a complete meltdown if they knew what I was doing. So why did Peter do it then? Because God had opened his heart. God had explained to him that the death of Jesus, that the gospel message of redemption was for Jew and for Gentile. And someone wrote this, the only thing that can destroy old prejudice is a new love. Peter was willing to put aside his old prejudice, put aside Jewish tradition for the sake of ministry. And note what he said, God has shown me that I should not call any man or any one common. He understood the vision wasn't about animals. The vision was about people. And reassured by this, Peter goes on to explain to the assembled Gentiles for the first time the good news of Jesus. You see, he realized when he heard the account of the angelic visit to Cornelius that God was at work. And as the apostle begins the declaration here, note verses 34 and 35. They're one of the most important in the Bible. Note what he says. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is. God does not show favoritism but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Our God is no respecter of persons when it comes to seeking salvation. All 
humans are made in his likeness and image and he desires that they will all be saved. See, racial barriers come crashing down because of the gospel. Ethical barriers come crashing down. Cultural barriers, social barriers, economic barriers, all barriers come crashing down because the gospel is for all people. And Peter goes on to present the gospel in three simple movements. Verses 37 to 39, he recalls the life and ministry of Jesus. Then verses 39 to 41, the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. And finally, the climax, the promise of salvation to all who believe, verses 42 to 43. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Salvation for all who believe, regardless of background or culture. And the final verses relate how many came to faith, and upon the initiative of Peter, they were baptized. Now, Ken Cuse writes this. He says, Few preachers have ever had a more receptive audience than the apostle Peter that day. Peter was prepared, the people were prepared, and the Holy Spirit was in control from the very beginning to the end. And he notes that Peter probably only spoke for a few moments when he was interrupted by a special working of the Holy Spirit. Cornelius and indeed the whole household heard that everyone who believed in Jesus would receive forgiveness of sins and they responded in faith. In fact, there was no altar call. There was no invitation given. They simply believed. And they were born again in the Spirit. And you see, the church of Jesus Christ would never be the same after this event. It was a catalyst that began to move the mission of the gospel out to the Gentiles. And remember the key verse in the book of, Rome, uh, book of Acts is Acts 1 verse 8. There the apostles are told to wait in Jerusalem. They would receive power. They would be Christ's witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And here it is, moving out to the Gentiles. It will move to the ends of the earth. And one writer simply states, the book of Acts is all about the expansion of the church ethnically and geographically. That is the one overarching theme of Acts. It is an all-inclusive gospel for people of every nation and tribe. And here we learn in this passage, in Acts chapter 10, the importance of obedience. Personal obedience by Peter is used by God to progress the gospel to Cornelius and to many, many other Gentiles. But as we conclude, we look briefly at this chapter. What are the lessons for us? Well, the challenge, first of all, to remember Cornelius is a reminder that no matter how sincere people are, no matter how good and upright and moral they are, they still need to hear the gospel and they still need to be saved. Salvation is not by works, by faith in Christ. It is by Christ alone. Many like Cornelius today are upright and good and respectable, but have never received Jesus. And the Bible declares they are in a lost state. Secondly, we are reminded the gospel is for all, and our God has placed no limitations on those he longs to see. If you and I should remember the gospel is not for one community, but for all communities. It is not for one culture, but for all cultures. We should be motivated to go out and to share about Jesus believing it is God's desire to save people from all nations and all creeds. And finally, as we consider how these two men who were radically and socially different were reconciled as one, as brothers in the Lord, we should remember that all believers are one in Christ, and therefore there should be no hostility or intolerance. It should be one in Christ who saves all, who is no respecter of background or culture or persons, but can save all and make us a child of God. Amen. Let's pray for a moment. Father, we have briefly looked at this chapter that is so pivotal in the story of Acts. We thank you for Peter and how you worked in his heart, how you dealt with that prejudice against those who are non-Jews, and how you revealed to him that you're a God who does not have favorites, but Lord, you love all mankind equally. And Lord, we are reminded that you came to die for the world. 
We pray, Lord, that if we are ever guilty of being prejudiced, that you would deal with us. And Lord, give us a desire to share the gospel with all people, especially those who are from a different background. And Lord, motivate us to be an evangelist to them where the opportunity will arrive. Remind us, too, that these two men who are radically different through their status and through their background were united through Christ. And remind us again that we're all one in Christ. Therefore, there should be unity and love for one another. And we pray, Lord, that indeed you would deepen our love for our brothers and sisters in the Lord and help us to work as one for the glory of Jesus Christ. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We close by singing, Your grace that leads a sinner home from death to life forever and sings a song of righteousness by blood and not by mercy. And the second verse says this, Your grace that reaches far and wide to every tribe and nation. God's gospel is for all. Grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be our portion and strength this day and forevermore. Amen.